Hi, my name is Haley, and I'll be answering your questions today. Um, for number one, about my relationship with my parents, and in what way are they more like friends? I would say me and my mom can have very close um, conversations about a lot, a number of different things. Um, I feel like my mom is very open about like sex and relationships and the proper way to handle those things. Like since I was eight or nine, my mom has basically been giving me the puberty talk like on and off all the time. She has no, no qualms about talking about things that are like used to be taboo. I feel like in past cultures, even with her parents, they don't talk that way. They don't talk about, you know, menstrual cycles and other things like that with the same frankness that my mom does. And I think her generation at least her way of parenting comes from this uh, cycle of thought that it's like, my parents didn't do it right, so I'm going to do the exact opposite. I'm going to be really frank with things and allow my kids to talk to me about subjects that may seem very scary or untouchable, and I'm going to, you know, let them speak their mind to a point. My mother is a teacher as well, and I also, she was a single mom for 14, 15 years. And in that way, we have a closeness, but there's also sort of this tension where it's like I'm kind of riding the line between, oh, we're friends, and oh, I'm on your bad side now, or I'm disrespecting you, or you feel disrespected, where she's my friend to a point. You know, I can't cuss in front of my mom. I can't necessarily talk about relationships or boys in the same way I would talk about them with a friend. Obviously, she's my mom. But I can talk to her about very serious subjects like I've talked to her a lot about depression and my anxiety and subjects like that that I feel like not a lot of other kids get that opportunity because there's that line between mom and friend well my mom kind of tends to err on the side of friend because of me and my brother grew up so independent because she had to work three jobs and my brother and me basically we knew how to do laundry we knew how to cook basic meals we knew how to live <laughs> you know like on our own a little bit so I feel like we're almost on, we're on very similar footing as far as like our friendship and relationship goes. Um, for number two, I have a lot, uh, one of my friends is very <laughs> a little rebellious. Um, she, her parents are very, they're not normal, like they're not the norm but they are very much her friends because they are both addicts. Uh, her mother is a alcoholic and her father, while I would say he's probably not an alcoholic in the same way that you think of it, I would call him a functioning alcoholic. Um, he, they go to concerts together, her and her dad, and they've gone on vacation together and her father is aware that she drinks and aware that she abuses alcohol, but he doesn't necessarily stop it or, in my opinion, I don't know if he actually thinks of it as bad behavior. I want to say he doesn't care, but I think that he does. He just doesn't either know how to stop it. And plus, since they're on that, they're at that place where they're on equal footing, where they're friends, he can't necessarily not condone <coughs> her actions sorry he can't necessarily say you're doing you know bad things when he's doing the exact same thing so I feel like that's an issue when it gets to that point where they're both engaging in really terrible or really harmful behavior where it's like unsafe sex and you know you drug use when they're both doing those things that's where things get really dangerous um and that's where you're towing the line of bad parenting <laughs> worries with uh, a couple other of my friends. They're, they're on good footing, like, where they're friends with their parents, but at the same time, their parents, you know, are a step above them. Like, with my, me and my mom. I would say on the most part, that's how it is. Parents are, yes, they're very friendly, and yes, they like your friends. They talk to your friends. They understand you more more these days. But in a way, there's still, you know, there's still that line for most kids. Um, for number three, sorry, <laughs> one of the things I have noticed, can you elaborate? Um, I would say yes, definitely kids do have very close relationships with their teachers. I know, I think that can come from a point of sadness as well as, you know, we're on friendly terms. A lot of kids that I know have formed really deep relationships with male teachers, usually boys with male teachers. Because, <clears throat> because they are lacking a father figure, and so they kind of latch on to these boys. And I also had to, to these teachers, these male teachers, 
and they just want someone in their lives to kind of stabilize them and tell them, you know, you're going down the wrong path, or hey, you did that well. Um, and in other ways, I feel as if it can, it can still come from a place of sadness with females as well. My friend Esther, um, she, her father passed away last year, sophomore year. And he had been sick for a very long time, so she'd been having some issues with that where she was depressed and she had severe anxiety. And she formed a very close relationship with a teacher, um, Mrs. Mathis. And she was our geometry teacher. And they lived very near each other in the same neighborhood. I think that's also a thing, like we all live in the same neighborhoods now, so you gotta get, see your teachers on a different level. But, um, and they formed a very deep relationship where she actually told Mrs. Mathis, like, I'm thinking about committing suicide and I don't know what to do. So Mrs. Mathis passed that on to, um, to an authority that could kind of, you know, make Esther go to get help and go to a, <laughs> go to a place where they gave her help. And I feel like in that way, it kind of turns from a friendship towards a more teacher-student relationship because at a certain point, the teacher can no longer pretend or no longer act like, oh, we're the same age, we're friends, tell me everything, because they have to do something about it. They can't have that on their record. Like a student told me they were going to commit suicide. They have to do something through the school to change that. So <coughs> for me... For number four, I do consider teachers to be an authority for the most part. My mom is a teacher, and since we're sort of on equal footing, I do feel like I understand the underside or the underbelly of education a little bit more than other kids. So, <laughs> at the same time, I do respect teachers so much. They're my favorite people. I love teachers. I get very defensive whenever people attack them because, obviously, I know how much work it is to be a teacher and how hard it is. But at the same time, I feel like because I'm with my mom all the time and I see, you know, teachers are real people, <laughs> I don't necessarily keep them in, like, this godlike position. I, I can recognize when a teacher isn't doing their job, and I feel like kids are very vocal nowadays about how they feel about their teachers, whether it's on social media. And a lot of times, it's not right. You know, you shouldn't be attacking a teacher because they gave you too much homework on the weekend. Oh, they're a, you know... <laughs> they're a bad word because they did that but there's another there's a whole other side of that where it's like you should be able to have a constructive conversation about what a teacher is doing like recently I have a Spanish teacher who while his students get very good test scores he's a, he's a good teacher in that respect we're prepared for the test but at the same time he instead of motivating his students to want to learn he kind of does like this beat down thing where he's just like you guys are doing this right you need to get better you know if you don't get better you'll fail the test he's not motivating his students to learn he's instead making them hate it so much <laughs> that you either go one of two ways you either completely abandon trying for this subject you don't care anymore you're like even though I know I need to improve I don't care because I'm just so dumb with him or I think in his philosophy of teaching you can go the other way where it's like man, I'm doing so badly, I really need to improve, I really need to work hard. But you lose, like, at least half of your kids that way. They no longer want to learn. They no longer want to attend class. And I feel like, in my opinion, that's your job as a teacher, to get kids excited about learning the subject, or at least proficient in it, where they don't hate the class so much. I used to love Spanish, and now teachers like him are, you know, they don't want to accept student criticism because they feel like you have no idea what my job is like you have no idea what I've learned my philosophy well I'm the student I do realize that I didn't go to you know to college to become a teacher but I do recognize your impact on the students because I am one and I have I'm experiencing that impact so while I want to respect teachers as an authority figure I feel like because they're teaching me and because we're older now we're not young and we have no voice we're older now we can articulate our opinions we can talk about this High school students should have their, they have the responsibility and the right to talk about those kind of things. <laughs> it sounds really bad, but I do feel like students should have a voice in the classroom. And a couple of my teachers have said, you know, if, I'm, if I say something wrong, correct me. You know, if you don't agree with something I'm saying, please tell me, you know, after class or just come talk to me. And I do like that about my teachers. I feel for the most part, though, I do have a very solid relationship with my teachers. And... It's not really a problem with, like, authority or respect. Um, 
But number five, some examples of kids challenging teachers. I kind of went into my own. It was a little bit of that. I mean, in my school specifically, I probably wouldn't be able to tell you very many. There was a time when, with the same Spanish teacher, we had a lot of issues this year. He definitely, he definitely experienced some uh, backlash because a student who had recently had a lot of medical problems was checking her phone during class and he didn't like that so he got really mad he made her cry and I don't think he realized the implications of that so a lot of kids dropped his class that was sort of an accidental one as far as like planned out ones there have been a lot of outbursts about what constitutes as cheating anymore um, a lot of students believe that it's perfectly fine to copy work as long as it's daily work or you know like an assignment that doesn't count as much as a major grade and so I think that it's pretty bad. Yeah. What? Okay, anyway. Um, as far... Okay. I'm sorry I didn't have a lot of great input on that. <laughs> Number six. Um, what is your expectation? Um, from celebrities, I think it kind of depends on your level of celebrity. Um, as far as, like, how they relate to fans. A lot of the times, people think of YouTubers as celebrities, as, like, real celebrities. And I don't necessarily believe in that. I feel like YouTube people or, you know, people who vlog on YouTube and post videos, they are us. <laughs> like, the only difference between them and me is that they post videos online and people know them for it. They're just people. Like, I feel like with a lot of real celebrities, like, my definition of a real celebrity would probably be someone who makes content that is highly publicized. Like, um, a film or a television show, or as a musician that's, like, highly, you know, like, highly revered, revered by a lot of people. I wouldn't consider, like, um, Phil, Dan and Phil from YouTube, I wouldn't consider them celebrities. I would consider them YouTube celebrities, which is a lot different. And I think YouTube celebrities have a responsibility to more share the lives of people, because that's what they do for a living. They vlog, they post videos online. So yeah, they do kind of have a responsibility to talk to their people. <clears throat> to talk to their fans but as far as like real celebrities I feel as if they don't really have a responsibility <laughs> to do much besides make their work put it out into the world and that should speak for itself um I yeah, I felt sometimes though that celebrities don't they don't want to share a lot and I don't blame them because they get criticized a lot if they do but uh in my opinion I don't have a lot of expectations of celebrities of real celebrities <laughs> Um, for number seven, do I know anyone that has gotten a response as far as, like, I've gotten a few responses from, like, musicians, but they're not, once again, it's not, like, a real celebrity. It's not like Brad Pitt is, you know, like, tweeting me back. Um, the musicians, I think, was this guy, Anoop Desai, <laughs> me and my friends really liked him. He used to be on American Idol, so that was one example. And I believe one of my friends got a tweet back from a band. Uh, I think it was like All Time Low or an alternative band. Um, do you think is number nine? Uh, I think, yeah, there are different expectations. I feel like a lot of fans really feel like it's, it's sad. <laughs> it makes me angry because I don't really like that they have different, um, different expectations for fans. I mean, different expectations for celebrities, because it's not fair. There's so much pressure on these people to be there for their fans all the time and to follow them back <laughs> and to, you know, like, engage with their fans all the time. Why aren't you paying attention to me? Why aren't you tweeting me back? I hate you now. Well, five seconds ago, you loved them, so calm down. I mean, I think it says something about what quality of fans you have now, a lot of these fangirls, per se when like one comment will completely turn the person off of every single other piece of work this person has done. And that makes me angry because celebrities already have, all they should have to do is put their work out into the world. If they want to talk to their fans, that's great. You know, they uh, obviously I want celebrities to be nice to their fans, but <clears throat> I don't necessarily believe that they have to be so committed that they follow every fan back and do all this crazy stuff like that should not be it 
There is definitely that expectation, though. I really hate those girls on Twitter who are like, follow me back. I'm desperate. I might die. And I'm like, girl, get some real priorities in life. <laughs> like, go get a job. Go to school. Go study for a test. Stop spazzing out on Twitter and begging this kid to follow you. Like, it says, and that also makes me sad because it says something about the girl's self-esteem. Okay, I'm starting to ramble. But, yes, I don't, I do feel like there's definitely expectations. I don't know, I don't really know why. I feel like this culture just kind of promotes that kind of behavior. A kind of self-indulgent behavior where the girls really just want, they're craving attention from these people. Because they idolize them, put them up on a pedestal when it's just a person. It's a human being. Everyone calm down. Okay. One of the things we've noticed, um, I feel like with, for number, for number nine, I feel like there's so many more resources out there for kids to really go out on their own. I know for me, when I wanted to start writing, I searched online, you know, writing opportunities for young people, and I found this website, Youth Noise, and I just emailed the girl, I was like, hi, my name's Haley Samsel, I'm 14, <laughs> I would love to write for you. And immediately she was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. So then I started writing with this girl who ended up being my mentor for like two and a half years. And, you know, she was a college student and she just gave me so much guidance. And I feel like the same principles are there. You know, you still find mentors, you still find, you still make connections in the world. You're just doing it at a younger age because you have so many, so many more resources to start your business or to start blogging or to start talking to other people. You know, like, I didn't have to ask my mom if I wanted to make a Tumblr. I didn't ask my mom when I applied to be a blogger at Mobilize or at Youth Noise. I didn't talk to her about those things. I told her afterwards. <laughs> Same thing, uh, I blog now. I write for The Prospect, which is this college admissions website. I didn't talk to my mom about that either. <laughs> so I don't feel like a lot of kids feel... The internet, having a laptop, having a connection to the internet gives you so much more power just to do things on your own. And to feel like you can. Because you see these examples of people out in the world. You see it everywhere you go. BuzzFeed. Just Facebook in general. People are just doing their own thing. And I love that. <clears throat> as far as number 10. Uh, oh, some examples. Okay, for number 10. Um, I do know a couple people have started their own non-profits. Um, that was definitely important like through the internet. I've talked about this before, but there was this kid um, in my school who started his own nonprofit where he used webcam technology to tutor kids um, in, in Dallas ISD, which is uh, a little bit, it's north of us in Plano. Um, he, you know, started a tutoring program for these underprivileged or under under um, supported kids in Dallas ISD where they use uh, webcam technology to talk to these kids. I don't know how successful that's been. I have, I have to say that when you're this young, <laughs> it can be kind of rough. Uh, I do know another chat, another kid, um, she is now at Harvard. In my community, she started this thing called Spell for Success. And because she was involved in spelling bees, she really wanted to help kids who were from different countries because we have a lot of diversity in our, in our city, in our suburb. She wanted those kids to be able to learn, you know, to develop their spelling skills so they could compete in spelling bees, but also so they could just learn the language. I thought that was a great idea, and she's employed a lot of um, volunteers from my school, even now. You know, it doesn't stop once you leave. As far as innovative things, I'd have to, I don't know about that. Not, not in my community. Um, for number 11, um, around YouTube flawed sides. Um, I would have to say for this one, I do feel like they do show their, a lot of YouTube stars show their flawed sides. Even I think they would say that their flawed sides are a little bit more polished than my flawed side or my friend's flawed side because they get to edit it and put it on the internet. Um, I do like that they talk about things, serious things, you know, anxiety, panic attacks, depression, you know, being being different in any way, you know, a different sexuality, different point of view, you know, living in a different place than me. Um, I do like that that's becoming more of a discussion on the internet because I felt like that was missing for a, li a really long time just from culture. Um, and it makes you see that you're not alone in a lot of ways. And I could see how for a lot of kids, maybe not myself specifically, but for a lot of kids, they see someone out on the internet who's felt the same way as them or who's feeling the same way as them, and they're like, wow, I'm really not alone anymore. 
I know that's been said a lot, but it's true. You know, you hear it on the news from adults who are like 40 years older than me, but kids, it really makes you feel less alone. I know when I'm on Tumblr and I'm panicked about school or I'm panicked about my future, there's so many kids out there feeling the exact same way. And I especially love it when it's older people like Tyler Oakley or um, people who have been to college and are already gotten out of it or maybe they dropped out you know like maybe they decided this wasn't for me and they're now progressing in their lives they feel good about their lives it's no longer a matter of life or death am I going to survive that's what I like about them <coughs> um number 13 what are some more serious topics I would look up online I've definitely looked up um a lot of things about depression and about how to deal with um like friends who are depressed or who are exhibiting really extreme behavior because you don't know really know how to deal with that. Um, I know a lot of kids do that. <laughs> it's kind of normal. I have looked up a lot of things about crash dieting because um, I'm just curious to see like what are people's experiences with different kinds of diets and why they stopped and why they're still doing it because it's just interesting to see how that's working and why it won't work in the end. <laughs> Um, I, I did look up the thigh gap thing. I remember doing that because I didn't really understand what the obsession was with this thigh gap. And I remember I saw this really upsetting video where it wasn't necessarily like a young girl talking about it. It was an older woman who I think she calls herself something the banana girl. <laughs> and, um, fruitly the banana girl. And she was talking about how it's possible for anybody to have a thigh gap. How... She's like, it's not as important as you think, but it's possible for anyone to have a thigh gap. You know, like, you can do it with my diet, that kind of thing. Where she, And then she went on, like, this 10-minute rant about, like, how the thigh gap is, like, the definition of health. Like, how it, sh it shouldn't be, but maybe it is. Like, and I was like, girl, like, you have no idea how many self-esteems you're hurting right now. <laughs> and that's definitely something that hurts me when I see these videos up by ser serious videos. Not, you know, like, parodies or satire of the subject, but women, other women telling their, <laughs> women telling other women what they should look like, or, you know, how they should eat, or whatever. Like, it just should not happen. <laughs> I do have, that's definitely something I've looked up a lot, fat shaming, and stuff like that, because, you know, <laughs> not in a bad way, but I've always been interested in that kind of thing, because it just feels like it pervades culture so much. Um... What kinds of things did you maybe not ask your parents to look for advice on the internet? Um, <laughs> uh, I guess I would say anything like sexual. I don't want to talk to my mom about that. No, it's not going to happen. Um, I've looked up a lot of things concerning, you know, like what kind of fashion I should be into. Because I'm not really comfortable talking to my mom about makeup or fashion, which is kind of weird. My mom's never really been somebody who's really into those kind of things, so I've definitely looked up a lot of, like, makeup tutorials and fashion tutorials, even though I'm not really looking like it right now. Um, recently I've gotten kind of into that and trying to learn more about, you know, looking presentable. <laughs> um, for number 16, why do I think that really personal videos are so popular? I feel like so many of us so many young people and just people in general that are just kind of missing those personal connections that maybe maybe we didn't have them in the past but now it just feels like we're starved for them because I feel like with all this technology it's like we're missing out on so much like you're just looking at your phone that you barely experience life I hate when I go to a concert or I go to like a special event and all I see is like iPhones I'm like, experience this moment, have a good time, make those memories, you don't want your memory to be through a phone screen. And I recently watched a video where it was like a fa grandfather finding out that he's going to be a grandfather, you know, like my dad finding out he's going to be a grandfather. And it's moments like those where it's like, yes, this is captured on camera, but it's like, that's an experience that everyone wants to have <laughs> with their parents. Just stuff like that, where it's like, it touches you. And I feel starved for it in a way. I just want to see people happy. It's ha so hard to be. It feels like there's not enough happiness lately. Sorry this video is so long. Um, it just feels like people aren't very happy lately. And I wish they would be. 
with all, there's so much focus on the news about terrorism and the economy and just things that are going wrong in the world. People just want to find those personal moments where, you know, that kind of goes away. And I feel like where all of that goes away is moments like that, like deaf girl hearing for the first time, dad finding out about his, dad finding out about his, you know, his daughter being pregnant, you know, guy finding out he's getting into college, all those types of things. And plus you look forward to those things. Sorry, I'm rambling a lot. Um, when or why would you share a feel good video? Um, I would definitely share a feel good video if it relates to like my situation and how I feel like other kids are feeling. I remember I did share a video where it was, um, I've shared a lot of videos that are like feel good videos. Um, uh, I would say I shared one once. It wasn't necessarily a feel good video. It was this, uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, uh, clip where Will talks about how his dad, Will is addressing, you know, like his dad and all the things that he, how he's wronged him. And he's like, I'm never going to treat my kids like that. You know, he doesn't have to be a part of my life, but I'm never going to be like that. And I felt like I related to that so much that I wanted to share it with other people. More so than like, you know, like baby laughing. Like I don't really care <laughs> about those kinds of things. If it touches me and I feel like other people can relate to it, I will share it. It's different because the other content is more just like, read my article or check out this or check out our newspaper. Where is this? I'm like, relate to me. <laughs> like, even though we're both staring at computer screens, relate. Um, number 18. I have done a lot of thinking about this. I remember seeing this question and kind of spazzing out. Because I've thought about this a lot. The intimacy question. How do you re reconnect with technology? And it's hard to tell. Because, <laughs> sorry. It's hard, to, it's hard to answer this question because it's just so... I watched a video recently, it was done by Intel and Vice, which is a news uh, network you probably know about, um, they did this thing called, it was based around the movie Her, and it was like love in the digital age, and it featured a lot of people I really like, uh, comedian Mark Maron had a lot of actresses and actors that I respect, who were sort of on the fringe, but they just talked about, you know, how is love gonna work <laughs> in this world that we live in? And, uh, I just feel like, for me, I don't have a ton of experience in the relationship area. If you maybe, I don't know, you probably can't tell. Um, I have not had a lot of experience. But experiences that I have had, technology has been more of a obstacle than, like, a way to facilitate a relationship. I know that a lot of kids or a lot of girls might say, oh, Snapchat's helped so much. You know, like, I've got to know my friend. We get to talk all the time. Texting, I text all the time. Or, you know, other other things, like, whatever you call it. Um, what's that one? Tinder. I don't know if a lot of girls have used that, but I feel like they would be, like, you know, that helped me find a relationship or that helped me talk to someone that I was scared to talk to before. <clears throat> Whereas for me, I'm so much more comfortable talking in person. I'm so much more willing to get to know people when I'm face to face with them, more so than on the internet. Because I feel like on the internet, so many things can be misconstrued. And intimacy, that whole question of intimacy, that goes away. You know, relationships, you can t start talking to someone over the internet, but if you don't have that face to face connection, it's just not going to happen. And I feel like in so many ways, it's like, oh, if this guy doesn't ask for my number, he's never going to like me. And in my experience, like, that's just not true. <laughs> like, he can like you and not want your phone number. Or just, you know, like, want to keep you as a separate piece of your of his life. Like, I've had a boy that that happened with. Maybe he was lying. I don't know. I don't think he was. But um, both of us were just like, we waited so long to get each other's phone number just because it felt so nice not having that person like not having not ruining that relationship through a text or through you know like a bad message or bad text fight um i'm totally rambling but coming back to like intimate moments it has to be face to face it has to be even with us young kids us <laughs> us misconstrued millennials I feel like we have to come back to the conclusion that although, you know, Rolling Stone may be talking about how our relationships are becoming more open, so many kids I know just want to be in a relationship. The guys, the girls, even in high school. 
the guys just want to, a lot of guys I know just want to, like, get with a girl. Like, they just want to be safe. And I feel like they, everybody just wants a security blanket away from this, I, all these new ideas. And it's almost like, since I'm learning about the 50s, or I've learned about the 50s in American history, it feels like that. Because there's so much new that everyone just wants to go back to the old. I don't know if that's going to be a trend forever, but I feel that happening. Maybe it's just in the South. Maybe it's just my city. But I do feel like a lot more kids do want to go back to the traditions. Maybe it will actually happen. Maybe they just say they want that. But I don't know. It's too hard to be intimate with people that you meet through the internet. It's just too difficult. Um, why is your generation turning to stuff from the past and sharing the stuff online? Um, so many kids want to belong to something and you're like, I'm a nineties kid. That means like, Oh, you're cool. You understand what it used to be like back in the day. And I do feel like I, I'm part of this club. I just, I, I don't necessarily feel like I need to be retro because that's like, we live in this generation. Let's just live here. <laughs> Let's not keep turning back to how things used to be. But at the same time, I do recognize that, you know, like, I looked at, like, Disney Channel and, like, Nickelodeon nowadays, and it's just not what it used to be. I feel like everything's just so commercialized, even more so than it used to be in the 90s and 80s. Like, everything is just so clean. When things used to, they did used to mean something more. I feel like children's programming today and Disney movies like they met more back then maybe it's just because we were younger but like I've looked at some of the content nowadays and it's just so uh, it's just so meaningless <laughs> I think that's why we're turning back to it it meant something to us as far as like our mental you know cognitive development and we look at this new content and we're just like what is going on <laughs> but I don't know I feel like we just need to kind of learn to live and I feel like that happens with every generation I don't think that's necessarily just us I feel like every generation, you know, they look back at, like, the 70s and 80s as, like, the golden years of rock and roll, you know? Everybody looks back at, like, some age as better than now. The 50s, for all these old people, the 50s were the best time ever. <laughs> for my grandparents, you know, who were born in the baby boomer age, it's like, the 60s were crazy, let's go back to that, let's get some social activism. I, I kind of feel that way. But, I don't know. There's also this feeling, I'm rambling again, but there's also this feeling of displacement among millennials where it's like, everybody wants to belong to a different generation. I wish I was alive here. I wish I was alive then. I wish I wasn't alive now. Um, that's rough. Um, so many kids are yearning for a thing they can't have. And that's rough. I feel like that's where a lot of the unhappiness stems from. You know, they wish they were prettier. They wish they had more followers on Twitter. They wish they lived in a different place. It all just comes back to that feeling of like insecurity with yourself. And once again, that could just be us being young. I don't know if that's necessarily, like, millennials are so different. I just don't believe that. And since I worked with Mobilize, which was a millennial nonprofit focused on, like, millennial issues and helping millennials start their own nonprofits, I've become more and more firm in that idea that millennials aren't that different from past generations. We have different tools, yes. We have different resources. We take more initiative. But at the same time, we're human. And we're young. And we're making a lot of mistakes right now. But in the end, I think people will begin to see we're so much like the generations before us. We're not that much different. You can ask teachers today. They say, oh, they have shorter attention spans. But at the same time, they, they take in information faster. And at the same time, they come back down to the same kids that we taught 20 years ago. People are so similar. We're humans. Um, 21. <laughs> it's cool to be nerdy. Why, what, how? <laughs> I don't know if it's that cool to be nerdy. I would say that, um, <laughs> the real nerds, I would tell you, okay, it's cool to be nerdy to a point. I feel like a lot of kids respect other kids who have pursued their passions to a very, to a point. Like, if, and I feel like there's some passions that are more, that are obviously more accepted than others, others. Like, if a kid's politically ambitious, that's amazing that, you know, he's involved in all these student government things, and he was an intern for the senator, you know, like, he's working for the mayor, like, he's doing all these things, that's awesome. And the same thing goes for kids that want to be doctors, you know, like, they work in a lab, they, uh, volunteer at the hospital during the summer, that's awesome. Then there's other things where you're just like, well, kids don't understand it. <laughs> there's some aspects of being nerdy where just kids just don't get it. Like, if you're into, um, cosplay or, like, costume play, a lot of kids don't get that. I'm not into that, but, um, kids don't get when other, when people want to, 
a lot of more popular students don't really get it when the real nerds <laughs> want to go dress up as their favorite anime character, like go to these conventions. Same thing goes for kids that are super into comedy or are into maybe coding or like computerness or computer, computerness, computer activities. Um, I just feel like there's a stereotype where it's like there's a nerd culture now to a point. I feel like there's still different sects of nerd culture that are not as accepted as others. Um, you guys probably know about the Nerdist with Chris Hardwick. I feel like that is a great thing that people are now like, wow, it's okay to have these really weird passions. And at the same, I really like that there's like a nerd culture now because it makes it more accepted. But it does kind of, it still singles people out. It always will. <laughs> you gotta find your own sect of the internet to be involved in. I do like now that the same kids that used to be very stereotyped as one thing, like, oh, you're the athlete, oh, you're the nerd, you know, you're typecast as a certain thing, oh, you're the theater kid. Now people can be involved in more things without being afraid of it. Like, I know so many kids who are, like, they're in the speech team, they're in theater, they're in student government, they're super popular, they play tennis, they do all these different things. Like, everybody's involved in different aspects of the school, and that's pretty cool. Oh my god, 30 minutes. How is that? What? Okay. <laughs> number <laughs> number 22. Do I feel like high school students today are more stressed slash anxious? Um, yes and no. Yeah, it, you, you, you said about schoolwork, but I don't think it's necessarily schoolwork that stresses us out. It's just like the pressure. I don't know if this is necessarily, like, and once again, I'm coming back to the same point where it's like, we're not that much different, but if I can just talk about us, um, there's a lot of pressure to be so good at different things, and that kind of relates to the nerd culture, where it's like, you're expected to be both academically proficient as well as proficient in all these different areas. You have to be able to write, you have to be able to sing, gotta be able to dance, gotta be, gotta be able to play sports, gotta be able to do all, you gotta be able to do everything across the board or else no college is going to want you. That's the sentiment that all of us feel. You gotta be everything. If you aren't, if you aren't everything, then you're useless to society. You have to be able to do everything. And that's a problem because I feel like people are so much more effective when they're pursuing one thing rather than kind of spreading themselves out everywhere. And I'm totally guilty of this, I swear. I've evolved in way too much. And I know that if I hunkered down and went down to one thing, I would be so much better at that one thing. But we're a product of society. We're a product of what society wants. You know, the president and the politics are telling, or the government's telling us, if you guys aren't, if you guys don't get a college degree, if you aren't proficient in technology, we will fall behind and our country will go downhill. You need to be good at everything. <laughs> and that's where the stress comes from. Yes, it feels a little melodramatic, but I feel like that's where a lot of the stress comes from. Parents are putting that stress on their kids, especially parents of immigrant students. I know in my community, I was shocked when um, I went to ninth grade and a lot of um, Indian students or Pakistani students um, Asian kids came to my school because we had the IB program, the International Baccalaureate program. So they had to transfer to our school. <clears throat> and so we had all these Indian kids in my classes and I, you know, got to know them and I became friends with a lot of them. And from there it just became like, I realized how different that culture was where it was like, not only are you expected to be academically, like you are going to get an A, there's also this huge pressure of you have to do everything else. And I think that's where a lot of the pressure I put on myself. A lot of millennials put a lot of pressure on themselves because they want to make their parents proud and they want to make their culture proud. They want to make, meet those cultural standards. And since we're all so different, we're just all so different. Um, my grandfather is Mexican and he grew up from nothing. And now he's not like a multimillionaire, but he's pretty successful. You know, like he lives in a nice part of town. He's able to help me a lot with a lot of my finances he won't be able to pay for my college or anything but he's helped me a lot and just like pursuing things that I wanted to that I would not have been able to do without him and looking at him you're like I need to become even better than him because that's what he wants me to do is that generational aspect of it and I feel like a lot of people have had that same issue the ex generation had the same problem where it was like they're just trying to make their parents proud but Millennial generation, man, it's everywhere. We're surrounded by examples of it. <laughs> anyway, um, 
for number 24. Oh, gosh. I seriously, that's not a good question for me. Number 25. <laughs> Do you ever try to unplug from technology in any way? Yes, I have this app. Let me go look at what it's called. It's called Cold Turkey. It's a good app. Um, it basically, you tell it when you want it to shut off all of your internet or all of your, not all of your internet, but all of your social media sites or whatever sites you want it to block, and it will <laughs> for, like, however long, and you can't disable it. Like, it's almost impossible. Like, you have to go, like, look up this super long instruction form of, like, how to uninstall the app, how to, like, block it from doing it. It's just insanity. So I've started using that lately, especially because I am so, I am such a distracted person. Like, I've noticed that when I'm even in class, I am always, like, looking, not necessarily, like, always looking, looking at my phone, but I'm always just, like, kind of playing a game, or I'm talking to a friend, you know, like, I'm listening to the lecture, and it's almost like I can't concentrate unless I'm doing something else, and that kind of scares me, <laughs> so lately I've been trying to kind of unplug a little bit more. Next year, I'm hoping that I can do that a lot more, where it's, like, buy phone, buy iPod, buy computer, like, just work on school things. And it's hard. It's hard even with the cold turkey because I still have my iPod. I still have my phone. So, I don't know. I'm trying. <laughs> and number 26, yeah, I definitely would say a lot of people that I know are starting to get more focused on unplugging <laughs> and, you know, kind of taking a mental break for a while. <laughs> um, I know a lot of people who do it, you know, without having to try, but I do know a lot of people... Um, in my grade who struggle with that it's just because we have to use Facebook and a lot of these different social networking sites for school on Facebook I'm a part of like too many Facebook groups like too many like extracurricular like groups from school and I'm constantly having to check them you know to make sure oh I'm meeting this deadline oh we're having a meeting on this day so I'm constantly doing that and I feel like that kind of comes back to bite you in the butt because then you're on Facebook. You're like, oh, let me just go check out this article on time. Let me just go check out, uh, let me go message my friend. <laughs> you know, like you're doing other things rather than just checking your group. And, oh, I'm just the most distracted person. It's rough. <laughs> but yeah, I would say a lot of people are getting more conscious about that and using apps like Cold Turkey. I remember I found that like on Twitter. Like someone was like, use this if you want to get anything done tonight. Um, but anyway. I think that's it. Sorry, this video is so long. Thank you guys.